Good morning. My name is Randy Iwasaki, and I'm the Executive Director at the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. John and Larry, thanks again for inviting me back. I think the last time I spoke was in San Diego at one of your annual conventions, so thank you for inviting me back. I appreciate that. The Contra Costa Transportation Authority is a sales tax authority. There are 25 counties in California out of 58 total that have passed sales tax measures. So multi-year half cent sales tax, quarter cent sales tax increases to raise revenue for transportation projects and programs. And we're one of the 25, we're located in the Bay Area. We're also the congestion management agency for our county. And so we measure congestion at about 140 different locations throughout our county and put together a biannual congestion management report. And we use these metrics to determine whether or not our investments are paying dividends. And so if congestion is rising rapidly in certain areas, we try to figure out why. And then we try to make the right investments to solve those issues. And lastly, we developed and founded the largest secure autonomous vehicle testbed in the United States, Gometu Station. I have some slides on that. This is what we do. So we from everything to fund ferry services here. So we've reestablished ferry service between Richmond and San Francisco before the pandemic, very popular route. We fund bike, ped, and trails. We oversee the all aspects of project delivery on the state highway and interstate system in our counties. So the Caldecott fourth bore project that was delivered on time and under budget. We invested about a half a billion dollars widening State Route 4, modernizing State Route 4 from four lanes to eight lanes, inside and outside concrete shoulders. We oversaw the construction of that as well. It was delivered on time and on budget. And most recently, we delivered Interstate 680 HOV lanes uh, 365 days early. And I, I have a slide on that. Always ask what's happening in the future. Federal excise tax. It's still 18.4 cents, 1993 was the last time it was raised. William Jefferson Clinton was our president. The lame duck session hasn't been raised since. State excise tax, I think it's important to note in California, Senate Bill 1 raised the excise tax on gasoline up by 12 cents and on diesel 20 cents. And then there's some fees associated with electric vehicles for the registration to raise revenue because they don't pay an excise tax. A lot of disgruntled citizens here in California about the fact that the legislature took the initiative and passed that bill themselves and didn't take it to the vote of the people. But I remember very distinctly because I wrote an article and I called, there's a part of our newspaper, there's a thing called the Roadshow. And I actually uh, called the Roadshow, Gary, and I called and I wrote a, an article. So when the 12 cents was, there was two six cents increases that was gradually raised and the price of gasoline after the 12 cents was input into the, the price of gasoline was $3.79. I go to Costco here in Concord to get my gas. So I use that as my barometer. Today, gas is $2.79 a gallon. And so a year after the excise tax was, was increased, gas is dropping dramatically because Russia is overproducing, the Middle East is overproducing. So my article simply stated that Excise tax increases on gasoline are very necessary to pay for the upkeep of our transportation system in, in the country. But yet you complain, but gasoline is a dollar less than it was when we added the 12 cents. I don't hear any complaining now. But I think you have to remind the constituents that this excise tax, while it raises the gas gasoline a bit, ultimately it's market forces that drive the price of gasoline up and down. Talk a little bit about sales tax, developer fees, fees we collect developer fees here in Contra Costa County to mitigate for mitigation purposes and build transportation improvement projects. Uh, Senate Bill 743 VMT, Vehicle Miles Travel. We've got a grant from the state of California to build a framework for VMT mitigation. This, this idea was developed for big developments because in high, highly congested areas, it's very difficult to improve major development using level of service because as you build these new big developments, you're gonna create more in and out traffic. And so what's happening now with VMT is you can mitigate the VMT. You can put car share, bike share, different strategies, different transportation demand management strategies in to help solve that problem.
cap and trade's been around in California for a while. Road user charge, pay for pay as you go. We have, uh, we're one of the states that are here in California that are testing. We had 5,000 participants in the last pilot, and there's another 1,500 more, more recent if you go to the California Transportation Commission and or Caltrans's website and look up road user charge, you can actually, maybe you'll still sign up. Public-private partnerships are still around. And then you have an opportunity on the reauthorization of the surface transportation bill next year. Hopefully it'll go next year, but if it doesn't, they're gonna have to redo the, the uh, FAST Act. So that's being worked on now. Construction initiatives, when the pandemic hit, we worked with our contractors to develop and follow the county health officials guidelines. And so we worked with our contractors to have an independent COVID officer, make sure they had the necessary paperwork in place. The county health officer wanted to have a sign-in sheet. And I said, that's not gonna work for us. We, our board deemed that CCTA a essential services organization because we had ongoing construction. And this is Interstate 680, and this is the first time in the 37 years I've been in transportation that I was able to take a lane on the interstate during the day. And so I asked Caltrans on April or March, probably March 11th, hey, there's no traffic. There's a shelter in place order. Can I work during the day? And probably took a week to get it, to get it approved, but ultimately we work during the day and, and they're finished. And so it's a year early. So there's some opportunities. Most, in every situation, every disaster, there's always an opportunity. In this case, we took advantage of very low volumes during the day. We've got some initiatives. I'll go over these initiatives. So we're the first agency in California for sure that used drones to pay a contractor for a, a, a item, in this case, borrow. So we're raising the profile of the freeway and we flew a drone, I think 150 meters, used LIDAR, it got a digital train model and then ultimately used uh, cameras and photogrammetry to pay. And it's pretty accurate. And so you know, we double checked, but imagine a day when you don't have surveyors, you know, running shots next to the highway causing the slowdown because people want to know what they're doing out there. And then use surveyors for those tight radius curves and some of the other more intricate details of construction that may be better suited in the future for them. Electronic inspection records. So we're using a lot of, of databases. We use cloud storage. We had an initiative that I developed a few years ago to go paperless at CCTA. And it was really just, just to cut down the paper agendas, but we went with electronic signatures. We don't have to, contractors now we do online bidding. So online bidding, contractors don't have to drive in at the last second, put the bid in. And you have all these bid runners running around. You got cell phone, backup cell phones and all that. This is a pretty slick, operation and the system the software tracks your keystrokes or your inputs and it tells you if you have an error so you have time hopefully to, to change your errors but if you don't and you override it and you hit enter the system knows you've done that and so it tracks everything and so it's a very very good system we implemented this to try to minimize the amount of bitter protests paperless contracting we've gone completely paperless it stores the the information tags the information so it's easily retrievable. This is important uh, as built. So as you may know, if you're a contractor, when you get the as built, typically they're not exactly as built. They're they're in some cases not even reflective of of what's happening out in the field, what's what's there. And so we want to fix that with use of this software package. in the future data is very important it's going to help us make better decisions on on funding projects on projects on strategies and so we're excited about the opportunity we've changed the way we do planning so we in this case public outreach is a good good example normally you have four open houses in four areas of your county or your region six o'clock on a Thursday, an ADA accessible building, you get 30 people at the, at the outreach event, 10 are your consultants, the other 20 don't like you. And so you don't get a lot of good information. 
we've actually revamped our website, created a website with, that gives you a budget when you log in to give your, you can spend your 10 Contra Costa or Coco coins however you want. We do uh, telephone town halls, very, very good. We had uh, 2,100 people, I think, on the last telephone town hall. We're doing an accessible transportation plan for a portion of our county. And we do robocalling and we do mailers. And ultimately, we had over 2,000 people online. So that's, you're getting a lot of information. We can still do better, but we're not st stuck in our ways of having that open house. Although we still have to have an open house because that's a federal requirement. Change the way we model the future. This is very important. Our models dictate our countywide transportation plan. Out of our long range plan comes transportation projects. And so we want to make sure that the, the modeling is indicative of the future. And so I think that's very important for us in our county. We don't have a lot of transportation dollars and we want to make sure we're not wasting any of those dollars on the wrong projects. Climate change is a big deal in California. In our case, 80% reduction from 1990, 1990 levels by the year 2050. We need a 57% zero emission fleet turnover and a slight reduction in BMT per capita of 15% by the year 2040 here. And then we can glide in to that reduction by 2050. And the, the new technologies that we're seeing on the forefront and that are being developed now and that are being implemented now, for the first time, at least in the 37 years that I've been in transportation, I see an opportunity to get to the underserved portions of our community. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects, but the underserved would be elderly, disabled, physically disabled, and uh, people that can't, can't afford to own a car, maybe choose not to own a car. We need to provide transportation options for them. There was a study that was shown that if you don't have access to mobility, it's very difficult to break through that, that poverty line. So we wanna make sure that we provide mobility for all. Micromobility is a, a big topic here in, in our county. There's scooters, scooter shares. And what do we do with them? Where do we put them? E-bicycles, bike share, car share. But bike share and e-bikes, we've, we've, we've launched an initiative where if you buy an e-bike, depending on your income level, we'll give you anywhere from $100 to $300 to help offset the cost of, the, of those e-bikes. And hopefully you'll take those to work or to school. And then we're trying to figure out how do we make these, our roadways that typically aren't in many cases designed to support this micromobility options. How do we modify the built environment to accommodate micromobility? And these are some of the benefits of, of micromobility options. And I like this one. We're trying to get a mode shift to transit after we get back to a, whatever the new normal is. But we want to put more people in our transit system than on single occupant vehicles. Kids are rethinking ownership. I think a lot of people are re rethinking ownerships of their vehicles. And so these are some of the statistics that we received. And on the lo lower here, you can always find where we got the, we fact check all of our, our slides and when i was 16 i was first in line to get my my driver's license that was a big day for me i got my driver's license for my car and i got a driver's license for the motorcycle and i've had those ever since but the young people aren't getting their their uh, driver's license and one of the reasons why they do is because they need that piece of id to fly but this is a uh, this is a good statistic that we need to leverage and provide them with the opportunity to stay out of their cars and and take transit Automated vehicles, we're working on automated vehicles. I have some more slides on that. Momentum Station really gives us a front row seat to innovation. We're very lucky. So there's a different types of uh, options that we can offer. I think these are some of the pictures of the different, you've got lane drops, you've got bi-directional travel, you've got side-by-side -side travel, simulating a freeway lane, tunnels, bridges, signal lights, stop lights, stop signs, HD mapping, these vehicles put out about 20 terabytes of data and most of the reasons are these very high definition maps that they that they need to see, literally to you know kind of see their way through. They look for the center line stripe, but they also want to know what these maps are doing. Maps are telling them it's gonna happen. These are our partners, list of our partners. We have very proud of our public-private partnerships here. 
So we competed for a, a couple of innovation grants last year. You know, we're, once again, we're a staff of 20. We're, I call ourselves a pea shooter size organization. But we, with a staff of 20 and our consultants and our contractors, we were the first to test on public streets on road on our roadways in Bishop Ranch in California. We were the second in the United States to put a vehicle like this on public roads with the approval of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, a US DOT. Las Vegas beat us, but they didn't test this vehicle very long. So it was a different pipe, um, but it was it was nudged. It was hit by a truck about two hours after the mayor announced and cut the ribbon on this, this service in Las Vegas going down the strip, a uh, truck backed into it. We're testing V to I, vehicle to infrastructure. So these signal lights, the signal phase and timing information, they're gonna have to be coordinated with those vehicles because they're gonna have to make a left-hand turn across traffic. And that's one of the most difficult maneuvers for these vehicles. And so they have to think about what that gap is, how fast that gap is closing, how long you have that green phase or how long you have that that uh, that green phase. If protected left, it's a different story, but you're gonna also be on wary of a vehicle running that red light. So th all these things have to come into play and we're testing that communication between the vehicle and the infrastructure. So we all right, we got our ADS grant. We were one of eight in the United States and these are, these are the goals of that. I think in this case, I wanted just to say that we're trying to change the way because we have a lot of sensors in these vehicles and they, 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 they sense exactly what's going on around the vehicle. We're looking at two proactive safety measures. Currently, when you think about safety, you think about number of fatalities, number of fatalities and injuries, number of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, which really doesn't tell anybody anything other than it, it looks, you, look, you track the number of fatals, let's say over the last decade, and it's, it's still around 40,000 people, but the cars have gotten a lot better. So we wanna start tracking the proactive safety measures. In this case, skidding, analog brake system goes off, your communication device sends, an, sends a, a note out to the owner operator, hey, I just slipped because I have GPS in my car at this location. Or there's a lot of interaction between pedestrians or bicycles at this one location. You might wanna come out and take a look because there's a number of cars whose sensors are going off because near miss or close call, another close call, another close call. Rethinking the way we approach safety. So we wanna roll these vehicles out the shared autonomous vehicles that you saw, that red vehicle, actually we're gonna use a local motors that's manufactured in the United States. And the idea is to get up to three of these vehicles to provide an on-demand guaranteed ride service in a gated community called Rossmore, where there's up almost 10,000 senior citizens, average age is 77. The facility has no stoplights. It only has stop signs. And the senior citizens are very eager to do this, to participate in this, to take a look at this technology, because many of them are driving because the transit service ends at five and the concert ends at seven. And so they're not gonna walk a mile at 90 years old or 80 years old, typically to go home at night. They're gonna probably drive and they probably shouldn't be driving. And so we're gonna try to solve this problem. Another problem we have at the county hospital, a doctor came into the office. I gave a speech in LA, he heard the speech and came in and said, if you ever have an opportunity to have tra transportation technology help us lower the absentee rate at the county hospital, many times the reason why they didn't make an appointment is because they didn't have good transportation. And so that does a couple of things. One, that takes a minor issue and potentially makes it a major issue, which may require a hospital stay. So if you think about a trip up front and it's, let's say, $10, versus a hospital stay at $20,000 a day. Someone's gonna pay for that and somehow. And so we wanna make sure that we get the people the care that they need and transportation is not the excuse. And then it also makes better use of the doctor's time. So, so we're gonna test self-docking wheelchair technology in this case. And we're excited about, we're really excited about this, this project. And then we're gonna test how many vehicles ultimately can be on a lane when they're connected and automated. We think it's more like 3,000 vehicles per lane per hour. The highway capacity manual indicates that it's about 2,000 vehicles per lane per hour. So if we can get 3,000 vehicles on that facility, automatically it becomes more efficient. You move more vehicles through that, that corridor. It's gonna be a, 
without widening, it's going to be a very good opportunity for us to improve transportation. The second grant we got was Mobility as a Service Grant. It was an ATC MTD grant from USDOT. These are competitive grants. We competed against, I think, 73 other agencies, state departments of transportation. Uh, we were the only we were the only local agency to receive a grant. In this case, we received eight million. The ADS grant we received seven and a half million dollars from USDOT for that project. This is the problem, really. This is westbound. If you can see the cursor going into San Francisco, <clears throat> it's the worst commute in the Bay Area the, the past 25 years. So we're trying to invoke a mode shift. And that's what I was talking about earlier. We want a 10% mode shift. Prior to pandemic, this is a this is like really a lofty goal. Now, if we can get 10% back in, it's, it's not that's not that many passengers. So we want to go post pre-COVID measure and then try to figure out how do we get 10% of the vehicle people that drive their cars into a transit option. So these are the costs of the of the various options. So here you got solar drivers, you got shared mobility, and you've got this SAV, shared autonomous vehicles. And so it's a lot cheaper. You can save money. These are the assets. So in the old days, in your communities, you may have had a bus, you might have had a train. That would be it. Today, there's a plethora of different options. So you've got ride sharing options. You've got all these, all these different options, SAV options, transit options, BART. And so these are the this is the services that, that we want to provide. So all this information goes into the platform. It's analyzed, cost, location, schedules, and now comes services. So you say, I want to go from point A to point B. It's a trip planner. It's scheduled, it gives you scheduling options. You only pay once. You don't have to pay. If you take a scooter, you're not going to be able to in the Bay Area use a clipper card. So you got to use a credit card. So you got to have multiple payment over a trip. We want to have one payment. And then real-time information, rewards and incentives. Imagine a day when you're looking at your, and I've done this study, so I've, I've seen it. 75% in pre-COVID of the riders on BART were looking at their smart device, 75%. Their, their heads are down, they're looking at their phone. And imagine if you could use advertising because people aren't buying, they're buying more of these, these streaming videos, Netflix, things like that. They're not looking at normal TV where you have all that advertising. So now the advertisers want an outlet. And I think the smart device is an outlet. So those are the incentives and rewards. We can make money while you watch your smartphone and portion of it can go to you as the person that's watching the, the advertising, but the transit operator gets a cut and so, so does the app developer. And lastly, it protects the connection. So if you're in Arizona, it's a hundred degree day, you take the bus and you get to point B and then when you leave, you're going to two part trips. You're going to go from your office to the grocery store. When you get to the grocery store and you're finished, you wait outside. It's 100 degrees and there's no bus. There's no option. And so we want to protect the connection of your of your planned trip so that you have an option there. and You're not standing out in the rain or the, the elements for very long, if at all. So these are the benefits of mobility as a service. We're excited about that. It works very well in highly dense areas. We're trying it in a suburban application. We haven't figured out the rural part, but it would have an application in the rural parts of California. Innovate 680, so we're, we've got a seven-pronged approach of dealing with congestion on a highly populated or highly used corridor. In this case, 680 goes from Walnut Creek south to the Silicon Valley. It seems like everybody wants to get up in the morning at the same time, leave to go to work about 6.30, you can see the congestion levels rising from 6 to 6.30. It becomes a very long commute southbound. Heading northbound in the evening, it's even worse. And so it's like almost 50 miles. It takes you about two hours to go the 50 miles. We're doing a behavior study on what makes people choose what mode that they're gonna take. We have a, we're actually taking and looking at multi-county down the corridor. So we're trying to integrate it with different counties. And then we have a, a very robust uh, outreach program and a stakeholder. So we have all the elected officials along the corridor buying into the project as we move forward. So that at the end, when the final project's ready to go to construction, the people living along the corridor, everybody understands what's gonna happen. 
they bought into it and hopefully it'll it'll smooth out that that construction program and it'll be it'll, you'll save a lot of money so these are some considerations that we're working on for the future electric vehicles we i talked a little bit about that that's part of our, our strategy to meet the greenhouse gas goal reduction in california governor newsom just announced by 2035 all vehicles will no longer have an internal combustion engine sold new in California. And so we're going to move over to this electric vehicle infrastructure. By the way, the electric vehicles actually can, if you have a, let's say you have a heart monitor, we have brownouts here in California and the power goes out for a while when it's windy in summer. When the power goes out, if you're on, if you have some life support system or these kinds of things, you can actually plug your your device into your car in the future. You can do it now, but they have inverters that you can plug it into the wall and it'll power your house in the future, your car. So this is power, power walls. So you have solar panels that charge your, in this case, a used Tesla battery and it fits on the wall. And then you have circuits for the essential things like a freezer, refrigerator, your TV, things that you wanna have working when the grid goes down. We're asking our builders to offer that as an option. We think we're going to have to do inductive charging. We bought the first four OEM manufactured inductively charged buses in America from Gillig, a bus company here in Livermore. And we put an inductive charger in at the BART station so that the bus comes by, it lowers itself, it lets passengers on or off, and then passengers come on bus driver does their notes for 10 minutes and then they go back on their way and when the bus makes its rounds after charging multiple times and the battery level gets to about 50 percent it goes back into the barn and fully charges deliveries on demand we're testing this starship here in concord i'm not sure the the results of that test but delivery services i think one state just said that delivery services can be used on the sidewalk and so I know FedEx is testing a robot, Amazon's testing a robot. There's a lot of different companies testing different strategies on how to make that last segment deliveries. Amazon Prime. So Amazon has said 200,000 drone deliveries by the year. By, I think it's by this year, actually. And so they are testing that. We actually have in our long range plan Skyports. So I was given a, a little bit of grief on adding a Skyport to our regional transportation plan, long range look, but these drones aren't gonna land in the middle of the freeway. They're not gonna land in the middle of your street. They're gonna land somewhere up high and then you're either gonna have to walk down or you're gonna have to walk into a building. It's not gonna happen at grade more than likely. There's too many rotors and things like that. And so once again, why not get prepared for the future now? Curve Space talk a little bit about this built environment. This is a smart mobility hub. How do you make the handoffs? without running people over. So you got multiple BART, you've got buses, you've got bicycles. How do you make these handoffs? We're working on that right now. We've hired a couple of consulting firms to help us with our smart mobility hubs. I mentioned Skyport, so yeah, this is in here as well. And personal robots. How do you leverage our, our the robots that are, that are gonna help us in the future? And lastly, Amazon, in this case, it's, it's, it's the Amazon Alexa is really like becoming a personal assistant. So I get up in the morning, I say, Alexa, what's my flash briefings? I'm eating breakfast. Alexa tells me what the news is. I say, Alexa, stop. And, and then she says, if you're on your way to work as usual, your commute is 11 minutes. Or don't leave now, leave in 15 minutes. There's an issue on your route because I'm very habitual and I go the same route every day. Uh, she'll tell me, don't go today. Don't leave here or you're gonna have to take a different route early so I can plan my day. These are becoming more and more uh, like a personal assistant. So thank you uh, for the opportunity again, Larry and, and John and others for inviting me here to speak today. And hopefully this works. So thank you.